So welcome everyone. And thanks once again. Today, as Aaron said, we're going to look at what are some things you should be thinking about if you're building a machine learning powered search application. And that can mean many things, right? And many different scales in production. But the intention of this presentation is to kind of give you the full view of things that you should be looking out for, all right, at, at different scales. Um, I'm a senior data scientist at NVIDIA. A lot of this work in the presentation was done um, at my prior employer, LucidWorks. My co-presenter, Jean-Luc Moyou, um, he also implements production scale search engines for a company uh, with Soho Squared, and, and they kind of consult with LucidWorks to you know, do some pretty big um, search implementation. So hopefully you find some of the things that we've learned over that time useful, and let's dig in. Perfect. So, so we're going to cover sort of three high level topics, call it that way. Uh, first, we're going to look at, hey, what's this new landscape of search recommendations? Uh, if, if you follow a lot of machine learning literature, you're going to find that there's just tons of buzz in the NLP space and, and computer vision space. Next, uh, we'll dive a bit more into what those considerations were that I was mentioning before. And lastly, which I think to me is the most important part of this presentation is what are you going to do with your signal data? And signal data simply means all of the user interactions that are happening on your site. If you're not leveraging that today, you're leaving a lot of money on the table or a lot of improvement on your search. Perfect. Um, so I'd like to begin with this statement. And this was from a senior VP at Google who I think he's been there for a long time. Every single link, uh, if you see something underlined in this presentation, uh, these slides will be available on my LinkedIn and on Jan's LinkedIn, uh, is a link to a separate um, thing. So, you know, this presentation is meant for you to be able to find all these resources uh, that you need. But he's saying, hey, this search thing is not going to, it's not a solved problem. And this is someone at Google saying this, right? And they've been working on it for decades. And they have, you know, the most computational power, the most data possible to generate really good search. And, you know, they're saying, hey, it's not a solved problem. Okay, so just keep that in mind in terms of if you get frustrated with your own search, like it is a hard problem. It's not very easy. This, this next slide, I know it's a little um, sort of ambiguous, but the reason why I put this here is if you're a product owner, mm -hmm. search owner, or you're doing any type of thing where you can enable information discovery, um, really think about your users. Because I think as you start to try to put these things in production or do production level search, you want to have a firm view of what people want within the context of your business, right? So that allows you to hone in and not waste a lot of time researching other things. The three domains that we'll kind of focus on today, um, they are, uh, e-commerce, in, internal company search, and, and customer support. And the reason why I sort of put these up here, um, I think these are three big areas of opportunity. And the corresponding thing that follows the arrow is the objective you're trying to sort of maximize or the thing you're going after, right? Folks want to make a ton of money in e-commerce for internal company search. Like people want to find stuff so they can get their job done. And for customer support, you know, finishing cases, right? So for instance, if you come onto my you know, support portal and you can find an answer without talking to someone, I've saved a lot of time, right? So you'd please keep in mind a lot of the practical implications of all the machine learning that you do in search and recommendations. And this last statement, uh, put yourself in the shoes of a user, but also kind of remember that you know, some of the search strategies can be applied to these different domains. So you can learn things from, you know, if you're internal search, you can learn things from e-commerce and, and vice versa. All right, let's hop, hop into this new landscape. And the statement below says machine learning influences heavily. And I think the main bottleneck that existed before was there was not hardware to actually put machine learning into production, into ranking systems and recommendation systems. But now the hardware is in such a state that you, know, you can deploy some quite sophisticated algorithms. <laughs> so just for funsies, I went on archive and I looked up uh, information retrieval and recommended systems just to get a peek at how many papers were there. And as you can see, right, there are, you know, a couple hundred to a couple thousand mentions of both information retrieval and recommended systems. I'm definitely not claiming that these 
papers are all about these topics, but the fact that they sort of show up when you search um, means that a lot of active research is happening in these areas. So let's define search very simply. Um, the focus, everything is about relevance, right? You put in a query and you want some things, these things that I return to you are technically, we're gonna call them relevant. And relevance has many different definitions depending on your domain. Um, more relevant means more similar. Uh, and the, one of the other reasons that I put this here is as you start switching over into a machine learning based ranking system, you know, more similar means it translates to a closer distance, right? Because the thing that you're searching for now exists as some vector in a vector space. And then you, you know, you search by distance. So your closest distance means that you're more similar. Um, content, not only text similarity is the name of the game. So I know I just read that straight off this slide, but what I'm really trying to communicate here is a lot of search engines prior to the machine learning driven ones were lexical based search, right? You're using edit distances, overlapping of words between what someone put in versus what's in the index. But now you're seeing a lot of different types of content being used to match a query to uh, different objects, right? So it could be the image, it could be other meta text, it could be signals. So it's not only the text that you originally indexed that can be used to give you better results. Let's take a look at this Amazon search page, right? And we're just gonna sort of look at the structure, but point out some things that you need to consider when developing your sort of search pipeline. So at the top, you have your search bar, that's where all of the information comes in. That is the golden ticket that you'll sort of see at the end of the presentation. On the left-hand side, you have your facets that are typically driven by how your data is indexed. So that's an area of opportunity to do machine learning as well, because now you can deploy ranking algorithms to rank your actual facets, right? Based on a query, what should be the best facets? And that's like a big ask, um, especially in e-commerce, because some items can have you know, dozens and well, yeah, in e-commerce, like I say, let's say if you take into consideration electronics, you can have hundreds of different facets, right? So how can you get the best facet to the top to engage someone uh, into making a purchase? Now notice I, I, I kind of cut off the actual results that were shown here and I left this sponsored section at the top. And this is very imp important thing to consider is no matter what machine learning that you do, at the end of the day, especially in e-commerce, there is a either a merchandise or some owner or expert that should be able to override all of the results that come from the algorithm. So you want to make sure that whatever model you're pulling results from uh, are able to sort of deliver, excuse me, deliver those types of uh, recommendations or search results. When it comes to recommendations, we're going to focus on two things, items for item and items for user. Uh, items for item can be split into many different ways, right? Almost every recommendation can be viewed as that. So given a particular item, what item should I recommend? And we'll look at some next. And then items for user, given your user ID, what should I be showing to you, right? That's more or less personalization in a nutshell. And there are you know, quite a lot of strategies there. When it comes to the types of algorithms that you see, like any tutorial that you look on recommender systems, you'll see these two words collaborative filtering, all you want to focus on is I'm recording all of the interactions that are happening with my site. Someone puts in a query, they click something, then they purchase it, then they, you know, they order it again. All of those events, I put those together, typically in some matrix factorization algorithm, some of the deep learning approaches are slightly different, but I'm trying to find out who, which users are similar. And then those algorithms automatically give you what are the best things to recommend for you. Right. But keep in mind, those things have no idea about what, you know, what's actually in the content of the things that you're recommending, whereas content based actually, excuse me, starts uh, matching on the content within, let's say, your text documents or your product descriptions. And then you start thinking about matching across images as well. And in the brackets, the thing with a collaborative filtering recommender, any of them most times, uh, you suffer from the cold start problem. So I get a new item. How do I give recommendations for that? Um, there's some creative strategies there, but that model needs to be updated every single time to include uh, new things. And that's where content base is typically used to solve that problem. All right, let's take a look at some of these recommendations on 
Amazon. And the reason that I put this slide up here, I want you to think about these three boxes, what different types of data or algorithms or type of algorithms I would have to use to produce uh, that type of recommendation. And what's kind of cool is when you search, you search with a text query, right? You put that into the search bar and you get some results. When you're doing recommendations, you actually just search with, you know, that item essentially is your query and you're going to be given some results. So on the bottom left, in order for me to deliver frequently bought together recommendations, I'm going to need some purchase signals, right? In terms of, hey, I need to go analyze all the things that were bought and find out things that were co-occurring, right? So sometimes you'll see that uh, to deliver really good recommendations, it's a fairly straightforward process, right? Versus this one where it's just for you uh, from our brand. So if you sort of split that sentence, just for you is a little more personalized, right? So I may be tracking some of the things that you've looked at before, but I'm also boosting on the brands that I want to show you, right? I think this top one may be sponsored. It might be on this side. And um, over here, I, I point out both collaborative and content-based. And the reason why I say that is look at the images, and this is my hypothesis completely, but you know, just explore with me. The images look very similar, right? So as you sort of start looking at SEO or the future of SEO, I think what you're going to start seeing, um, there's this whole new thing about recommendation marketing. So instead of you actually trying to rise to the top of the search result for a particular query, you are going to just try to be the next thing that's recommended after someone has purchased something or clicked something, right? And that is both a function of the similarity of the content, both the text and the image, but in addition to you know the user activity that um, is is being interacted with your item. Okay. Quick definition on signals, as it's saying here, it's pretty much anything that someone's doing on your platform, right? So someone puts in a query, you want to capture that. You also want to tie that to the corresponding you know post event, be it a click, cut, purchase, download, whatever type of interaction is meaningful for your business. However. Um, one of the things that you actually don't see in production or I haven't seen very much is this notion of a back signal. So someone puts in a query, they click something and they're like, I don't like this. And I go back, right? So if you actually have that time sequence of data, you can remove a lot of noisy data and actually train some pretty cool um, algorithms from there. And for most really good search platforms, they're using signals. If you're not using signals, then... Um, just start using signals, I would say, and you'd, you'd see tremendous improvements um, in your search. It won't be perfect, right? You'll see that as we move along in this presentation. And then this comment down here about privacy, this is going to be a challenge, especially for folks in Europe where you know GDPR is, is sort of prevalent. The interesting question comes about, if I use your signals, I don't know who you are. I just have some user ID. I know you clicked these 10 items and you've purchased these five items, but I don't see your name. I don't see anything that's revealing of you, but I use that in my model. Okay, so somewhere in my model is some inherent notion of what you've done. I can't actually extract it from the model, but it lives in there. So the question becomes, do you have the right to know force me to retrain my model without your data, right? So those are interesting discussions or, or things that you may face in different uh, domains. <clears throat> All right, so content is not enough to dominate the market. And the reason why I put this here is to encourage you to think about you do need signals, right? It's not just about the content that you've indexed and you get this perfect type of search. Every single day, people are being trained by Google to expect a world-class search, especially in internal environments. And you know, the second statement about people ruling the world with signals, uh, it, it, there's a very simple reason for that. And it's this, all right? If you've noticed that Google has been around for how many, how many years and their site has never changed, there is just one thing that you can do is give them data, right? They don't allow you to browse and explore or anything else. They want you to create this association. And to me, this is you know, one of the most powerful data sets that you can ever create, right? This is within your business. This is within um, you know, 
big search providers. That's why Apple and Microsoft are desperately trying to get you onto their browser so that they, they can make these associations, right? And once you start piling on deep learning onto this, like some of the things that they can come up with or understand in your queries are quite cool, okay? So just think about this. Everyone who is doing search in this present, you know, in, in this call today, hopefully you have, you have access to this type of data. Just go ask, I don't know where those logs are and basically just create data sets like these and um, you get to do a lot of really cool things. Now, there's a tricky part. Okay, if you, this is a little more for e-commerce businesses or I would say maybe large, uh, large platforms right, that need a lot of traffic. When someone searches on Google and Google redirects them to your site, what ends up most times happening is this, right? You'll just see someone come on your site, oh, they're clicking things, they're buying things, cool. But you don't have the original query that they came in with. So that means that um, you actually don't have the real power in the data to produce, you know, sort of world-class ranking. So as much as you can, to try to grab that data, it'll be to your benefit, right? So for instance, someone goes on Google, they enter your site, and then they really start searching on your site. You start to pick up uh, some of this data. And I had some clients that that was a big, that was a mission for them essentially for people not to search on Google, but to search on their platform so they can have data like this. <clears throat> so think about this for a moment, right? You, you're searching on my platform, and how do I really get to understand what you want? I don't know you. I don't talk to you, right? The only thing that I have to interact with you is this search query that you give me. So if you actually don't have it, um, it's very difficult to really understand what people are doing and um, how you can serve them better and get maybe more product out the door and things like that. Let's take a quick look at um, some history of search. Apache Lucene, that was, I would say, one of the core inverted indexes that came about. Um, at scale from dog cutting back in 1999. And that led to Apache Solar, Elasticsearch. Uh, I put this MongoDB at the search. This was a former colleague of mine um, and he's running search at MongoDB, which is kind of cool. So you have these three different flavors. And I may have mentioned that LucidWorks uh, that I used to work for, the guy who started that, he started Apache Solar on top of um, Lucene. So yeah, I'm a little more biased to Solar. And what we've seen is, like Solas does really, really well at scale, but that's still lexical based searching, you know, matching, excuse me, overlapping of text, oftentimes with edit, edit distance and other things like that, or TFIDF, but this is what's happening now. Okay, so dense vector search is becoming very popular. You're having a lot more data scientists working in search and recommendations and, you know, how are they going to start playing outside of the world of text? Okay. Now we get into dense vector search engines. That's essentially multimodal, as it's saying here, image, text, sound. Ultimately, I take my original data set representation, I do some machine learning, and I encode that into some vector. That vector inherently has meaning about maybe all those different types of modalities. And now the goal is when a query comes in or when you ask for something matching in that vector space, okay? Uh, the two ones that you could focus on are Fice from Facebook and Milvus. These are open source, um, but some companies that are doing it, you know, Google is obviously doing it and, and you'll see some slides after. Uh, Lucidworks does integrate both um, Solar with Milvus as well. Uh, Pinecone just came out. He was one of the guys that did uh, SageMaker. So they're doing dense vector search at scale and things like that. Gina is also open source. Um, they have a lot of cool examples on uh, doing deep learning uh, type search. And then Elastic has this thing called a dense vector search type that allows you to index vectors after you've done some machine learning to retrieve them from, from their Lucene-based index. Very quickly, what is, what is vector search, right? As I'm seeing here, you're not matching our text anymore, right? You're able to match on vectors. So just think of anything that you want to convert to a vector, you can essentially match um, like that. And it's really good for combining things. And here's a good link to learn more. So good books for you to keep in mind. Um, on the left, I, I, you should consider this kind of the Bible and information retrieval, right? There's some things that uh, Manning proposes in there that are very relevant. He has a really cool course on 
deep learning and NLP on uh, Stanford. Highly recommend you check it out. If you want to dig very deep, Lucene in Action is a good place. Um, Trey's book on Trey Granger's book on solar in action. You know, if you're actually someone working in solar, that's like the first book you should read. And he's also doing AI powered search, which I think will have some crossover into the solar realm. Same, it'll have analogs into Elasticsearch as well. So for the Elastic folks on the call, uh, you can find something. This was a beautiful book, um, super practical. He actually goes into examples of using deep learning in search. So if you wanted to implement something, it's pretty fun. Uh, relevant search is more about tuning search engines fundamentally. And the thing that really struck a chord with me was, um, I think, uh, yeah, Doug was saying in here that, hey, you know, in regular lexical search, you think of a word as a feature. So oftentimes in machine learning, I have this vector of 10 dimensions, right? So each number in that vector is, is a feature almost, right? Or when you think of your data set, you have features in your data set. But in lexical search, like a word is a feature. I, I chop the word, I expand the word, and that's how I manipulate and get better features for search. And then if you're actually responsible for the front end, this is a good way to present results, capture feedback on designing that front end system. All right, so now we've moved into the rise of language models. Uh, very simply, right, a language model has the probability uh, has the ability to give the probability of another word, right? Uh, given some sequence that came in, right? I wanted to keep this super high level, but is one of the most widely used ones in production, not by everyone, I would say, because of um, sort of performance constraints at inference time. But as you can see, right, tons of papers have been uh, presented on boot. So this is kind of the thing that's taken over. And then here's a little bit of proof. Highly recommend you watch this video from Google on their updates to search. And this was the same guy who I got the quote from in the beginning. But as you can see, I think last year, but was used for 10% of searches on Google. And they're saying it's pretty much on every single search. And I don't know if you've seen their new updates where they actually start highlighting sentences for you. And that's basically them chunking up the document and, and allowing boot to um, their version of boot, right? Their productionized version of boot to um, sort of rank. Uh, if you're looking for a very good paper on the history of ranking and, and that blending of lexical based searched engines with, um, you know, this new type of dense vector search, uh, this is a fantastic paper. I think this guy did his PhD and he wrote a really nice summary. And if you wanted to dig into the sort of details of BERT and why transformers work and whatnot, uh, Jay Alabar's visualizations are fantastic. And once again, every single thing in this presentation has a link, so you don't need to go search, just click it and, and enjoy uh, reading. When it comes to language models, there is a plethora. It is very confusing, especially for a beginner. Um, I highly recommend if you're in production and your boss is telling you improve search with machine learning, uh, keep it simple and you know maybe start off with BERT, um, but maybe you can use some of these diagrams to help you sort of find what's the next best model for you to look at, right? Uh, here's another one, NLP model selection. This is a link here. Uh, it's by this guy called Pratik uh, Bavsar. He's at gina.ai. Um, feel free to join his community called Max Pool, right? It's a Slack community. They do tons of stuff on NLP. So you can ask tons of questions in there. And he's really big into NLP and search. But he did this cool thing where um, he categorized all these models by criteria. So for instance, if I wanted a, an English model and I'm doing classification, these are the ones that I should select. So highly recommend you check that out. It'll, it'll save you a lot of time. Perfect. So we just explored, okay, we talked about lexical search. Then we spoke a little bit about dense vector search, but hey, there's this thing called knowledge graphs and you may have seen it at Google. Um, so all this statement is trying to show is that, um, you know, these things are important for industrial applications. And all a knowledge graph means in, in reality, it's I have some notion of entities and how they relate to each other. And how can I use that to generate better recommendations and search? So most of everyone would have seen this, right? You type in you know, some location or whatnot, and you get this bar on the right-hand side. That's coming from the knowledge graph. Uh, I'd like to make sure and keep the distinction between actual graph traversal 
versus just the concept of a knowledge graph of things being connected to each other, right? They're two separate um, sort of problems to actually create the relations and then to traverse the relations. So don't get too caught up there. <clears throat> Here has some examples of knowledge graphs in production. Uh, Amazon used this to do a bunch of COVID-19 research, right? To accelerate some things there. Airbnb used that to um, sort of organize their listings and, and present listings to folks in a better way. Walmart's building a very big product knowledge graph. Google has a big product knowledge graph as well, trying to compete with Amazon. Um, Amazon is developing their own um, as well. And like when you look at some of their decks, you know, they it's a very hard problem to solve. It's not easy and they're putting a lot of resources behind it. And this paper is from Home Depot where they're, they're doing a lot of, excuse me, knowledge graph type stuff as well. So it's not only deep learning, it's not only lexical search, but it's also the hybrid of these three are being used to present sort of top of the line results. Okay. Here's one thing I'd, I'd leave you with. Um, if you decide to go down this rabbit hole, it is probably one of the biggest rabbit holes that you can go down and to get, you know, some value for your money. Uh, please keep it non-trivial. I would focus on, I have a bunch of data. Um, I want to provide good search, be it products, be it a bunch of documents. How do those things or how do entities in those documents or things relate to each other? Focus on getting the relations first because that's the harder problem and then figure out at query time, how do I traverse across that data structure very quickly? Okay. Uh, learning to rank, this is, you'll see this um, with a lot of focused businesses. So for instance, if I'm working at a single company running search and recommendations for that company, it's a good idea for maybe for me to maybe look at learning to rank. And all you're doing is, you know, you send a request to, let's say, a lexical-based search engine, you get the top end results. You would have computed some features on those before, and you use different types of algorithms to re-rank based on the features, right? Um, deep learning is playing a bigger part in learning to rank. Prior to that, it was more, um, I would say, count-based features that were used to, you know, match a query to a document, but now these algorithms are getting a lot more advanced. Keep in mind that if you do some type of semantic search right through like a boot encoder or something, it's inherently doing its own sort of learning to rank under the hood. Like right? it's finding up, it's finding the top end things based on the query that you gave. So you might start to see this fizzle away where more deep learning based approaches are coming in. All right, let's talk about considerations. Uh, hopefully, Aaron, I'm doing well on time so far. Okay, perfect. And <clears throat> Yeah, my simple statement, not to offend anyone, we're in production, right? We're not trying to get the best new hottest algorithms working. We're trying to make money. We're trying to save money. Uh, we're trying to get you to keep your job as well, right? So keep that in mind. Um, keep it simple. Four things to keep in mind. Uh, what are the types of data that you have? What are you going to do with that data? How are you going to crunch it, right? All of the cost implications, maintenance of that infrastructure, things you have to think about. What types of algorithms are we going to use? And then, you know, what are we going to do with the things that come out of those algorithms, right? So when it comes to types of data, don't only think about the things that you index into your search engine, right? It's not only about those documents. It's about what other people are doing with those documents as well, right? How they interact with them. All of that information can be used to enhance your search. And the last thing I put there is metadata. Uh, metadata is both things from like manufacturers or other supporting documents, but also think about, hey, like there may be some forums where people describe my products, right? And uh, what you'll end up seeing, there's a discrepancy usually between a user's vocabulary um, and the vocabulary that's describing your particular documents. I'll talk a bit more about that later on. Think about text versus multimodal data, meaning... If I'm indexing pattern documents, I'm not only going to look at the text. I'm actually, if I pay attention to the images, there's lots of ways that I can use to improve search. Um, the lengths of documents, as you start doing more deep learning based approaches, that, that will become a bottleneck. It's typically some sequence length that you get to sort of predict on or index or train on. So keep that in mind. Um, there are different sort of, um, that's what I'm looking for. 
tokenization strategies to 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 get around that. Uh, this is very interesting. I learned about this from some of my colleagues. Where if you're in e-commerce and you have a bunch of different vendors, remember they want their product at the top, right? So if they can define their their catalog in a certain way where it aligns best maybe to the customer, but it's very specific and their competitors don't have that same type of verbiage in a lexical based search engine, naturally they'll rise to the top. So you'll end up seeing when in this multi-vendor environment, the data is extremely dirty uh, and it's almost intentional. So keep on, keep a lookout for that. Okay. When you go to process some data, right. You know, call Saturn cloud, probably just to make things easy. And, and that's a, actually a, a very serious statement. You, you don't want to be spending time doing that work. You have to solve search. Uh, think about modularizing your index pipelines, meaning I have data coming in from this source and I'm going to maybe tokenize it. I may be injecting extra entities like synonyms or whatnot. Keep that thing as modular as possible so you can debug um, certain parts. Uh, think about if you have performance implications for the indexing speed of your data, right? So if someone's using, you're getting a ton of new documents coming in and you need them to be available, that will change a lot of how you process some of the data. And this is more around signal data actually. And when we go to, excuse me, um, process signal data, that's like a query on what someone clicked on, doing all of these, getting that data ready for, you know, different types of machine learning algorithms or just, helping out in ranking, you have these two options, right? And Saturn Cloud, I think, makes Rapids on Dask uh, quite easy, right? And that's a very interesting alternative to Spark, right? If you do roll open source Spark, um, you know, it's not the version that Databricks uses, right? Databricks has much more optimized versions as well. So you, you always want to plan for that discrepancy, I would say, in performance and setup, right? But if you're just working on your own application, then you're spending all day looking at that. But if you're providing this as a service, um, just check out Dask and Rapids. <clears throat> so from a training algorithms perspective, uh, you know, naturally you would not want your training cluster to be on your production search cluster. And this becomes more important at scale. Like, you know, if you have a couple thousand users hitting your servers, it's not gonna bottleneck certain things. <clears throat> uh, here's an interesting one, right? the thing where you store your features doesn't have to be as the same thing as your search index, meaning I can have a lexical based search engine regularly indexing text, but I also extract some features, but they sit in like a dense vector search engine, right? So now you have this hybrid approach. When a query comes in, I encode it. I go check it against this search engine. I do an asynchronous call to check my lexical based search engine. And then you rank by maybe mixing some scores. And lastly, you know, when, when you get an output of an algorithm, right? You want to track, hey, what, what someone does with that particular result, knowing, hey, it came from this algorithm version, and that allows you to do some post filtering the next time you go to do some retraining. So the better you tag your data, uh, the better filtering that you can do um, and the better algorithms that you can produce. And this one is, is more or less the same as that last point, using the algorithm output. Uh, this is very tricky if you're using like a solar or elastic search and like a dense vector search engine and you're getting two different scores. Typically that's on a query level, right? They're, they're independent, but you know, they they have different scales. So be careful with your normalization and you'll have to do some, you know, really sit down and dig into some details to see what some good uh, score blending uh, heuristics are for you. Uh, keep keep a track of the scores from your model. So for instance, like, hey, I put in this query, it gave me back these 10 different documents, but that would have had a score with it. Monitor the scale of those scores. So if you're doing a, a heuristic based approach, um, that might actually affect, you know, how some of these results will come out later on. And the next time you go to do retraining, right? Now you're getting into the machine learning workflow. It's not a static search engine where we're accustomed tuning some weights on some fields. Like this thing is going to change over time. You have to keep into account seasonality. If you're doing Black Friday, please do not include your Black Friday, like e-commerce data into your model. Like people behave erratically on those days. So, you know, keep that data separate and, you know, hopefully you should keep some good results. 
okay, uh, for the data scientists, right? You know, I want to put my model in production. <clears throat> Ultimately, uh, you might not need to get really good uh, accuracy performance on the metrics that data scientists measure. Uh, testing in production is always good on, you know, some smaller set of traffic and make sure you're optimizing the business metric, right? That's that's super important. If you're doing research, then that gets thrown out the door and you just you try to get the best performance on that benchmark. But please keep that in mind. Um, beware. If you're using signal data at scale, it's noisy. People search behavior is different at different times of day. Um, you'll see these pockets of people searching. Some people just like to mess with search, like search sites because they know that people index that search data. So I, like we've seen things where people put in profanity and then in the type ahead, it'll show up because like you're not looking for that stuff. So yeah, if you have some you know, crazy users like that, be on the lookout. And as a business, if you say, I'm going to do machine learning and I'm going to curate these data sets myself, at scale, that's, that's very difficult. But big companies have that budget to hire folks to curate those data sets, check recommendations to see if they're good. Um, a good example of this is like, there's no ground truth for a recommendation. If I have this glass, right, what's the best recommend? What's the best thing to recommend for that, right? That's very subjective. So don't get too caught up on, on measuring um, hardcore machine learning metrics for, let's say, recommendations. Okay. Bill versus buy. Uh, I know I have a couple of bullets. That's not good uh, presentation style, but I wanted you to have something to take away. But ultimately, it comes down to headcount. This is the defining factor when you go to make this decision, right? How many data scientists do you have? And in my opinion, you want your data scientists doing, solving the hardest problems that you have, not solving sort of solved problems by other vendors, right? So I think it might be a good idea to eat the cost because they end up maintaining that particular piece of the infrastructure and you're able to just integrate all of the extra things that you're doing um, with your data science resources. The main thing to think about in any platform that you choose, especially for search uh, from a vendor, make sure that you can bring your own models. The last position that you want to be in as a search owner uh, or, or that product owner is, hey, you're just stuck with the machine and the capabilities of a vendor, right? You want to be able to roll your own into that same pipeline and that'll make sure you can minimize risk of performance. Okay, we're getting to the end here. And please just pay attention from here. And if you're kind of fizzled out so far, this is the one, this is the moneymaker. Um, I've seen signals generate millions and millions and millions of dollars in very, very simple ways, right? Um, so a good thing for you to think about is becoming intimate with the signal data and really trying to ask like, what is the delta, okay, like if you read this first thing, I'm saying identify what people want versus what you have. This is the fundamental problem of search, right? Uh, you are not, chances are you are not Google, right? You you might be internal search, you're, you're your own business. So you have a more bounded problem to solve. Meaning I have a thousand items indexed. Somebody comes in and they want a car, but I sell planes. Like I only have planes, right? So I'm not going to focus on the person that wants a car. That's a contrived example. Uh, but however, Keep that in mind when you go to try to solve uh, your search, uh, trying to align the vocabulary of your users to the vocabulary that's in your index, okay? And signals are a good place to mine synonyms, do learn how to do rewrites and type ahead, uh, things that you wouldn't automatically generate on your own. <clears throat> it's a cool site. Uh, it's a company called DataBit Machine. So they look at some of your signal data and they help you to find you know, better queries to purchase that will, you know, based on that um, better probability of, of someone to engage with content on more specific queries, okay? And they're typically cheaper. And I mentioned this before, but look for synonyms, phrases, and specifications. So the way that someone might specify hardware is based on some lingo. So go mine all of that um, sort of forum data and include that in your index. And that's a great way to, to win, essentially. Uh, I think I have, da, da, da. oh, I have some extras. So, but pausing here, right? We've, we've taken a quick look at, hey, what's the new landscape of search recommendations? 
you saw like dense vector searches coming up a lot. If you're at scale, thinking about knowledge graphs, even if you're not at scale, like even if you can manually create your own knowledge graph based on some of your knowledge, that can also help you as well. Um, when you start thinking about implementing um, search and recommendations from a more machine learning perspective, making sure your pipelines are modular, both your index and what I call your query pipelines as well. You know, we're always bound to some type of a response constraint, meaning like 50 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds. So you might have the world's best algorithm for ranking, but it takes 300 milliseconds. And, you know, your boss is telling you, hey, I need this thing under, you know, 75 milliseconds or something. So that all your research went out the door. And lastly, um, think about how you can expand your business with signal data. Right. Oftentimes people are looking for things and if you don't stock those things, but you have maybe capabilities to partner with someone who has those things, you can easily sell it um, sort of on your site. And we saw a lot of that in some of our customers where like people were coming, they weren't finding certain things, but like they were able to stock it and, and generate revenue. Right. That's more in the e-commerce case and, and wrapping up here. Uh, I'm releasing me and some colleagues are releasing a paper uh, kind of around this stuff, right? We're calling it a guide to machine learning in search. Um, uh, I won't ask you to read the abstract. I'll just sort of explain it. Most academic research is trying to win a benchmark, right? Oftentimes it's not really geared towards production. Uh, it's not beginner friendly sometimes. So this was just an effort to, hey, it's kind of a, a detailed version of this deck where we go into some things, things to think about, places to look, but more importantly, research is no longer bounded to the academic community. It's now involved, like, you know, Saturn will produce research, companies will produce research. So who do you actually network with? Where do you go to find code? All of that stuff will be in there, uh, hopefully uh, in May. Let's keep a lookout for that. Um, now that I'm at NVIDIA, I'm seeing a whole different world when it comes to deploying, let's say, deep learning models, right? So I highly recommend anyone doing deep learning check out this thing called the Triton in front server. There are many different model deployment frameworks. What's very interesting about this one is, you know, NVIDIA owns that hardware. So they spend a lot of time optimizing these libraries to sort of deploy on the GPU hardware. And this is more for deep learning. It's a good place to check it out. Links at the top. Uh, Tensor RT, if you're currently doing any type of training or deployment of machine learning models, um, these are some extra... <clears throat> It's using different cores on your GPUs, and I think it only works with certain GPUs. But what's really cool about this is if you have a business where you're training models centrally and you're deploying to the edge, or you have different domains where uh, your models have to live in different places, it's optimized for all of uh, NVIDIA's hardware. So that's kind of cool. And if you're doing recommenders, check out NVIDIA Merlin. It's their new recommender framework coming out, um, doing a bunch of rapid stuff crunching data on GPUs. Uh, highly recommend you check out this keynote. Um, they put a lot of effort into it. Watch the keynote 2020. It's like seven minutes, at least the first part. But you're going to see some really cool things come out, some things I can't say yet. And I guess, yeah, check out GTC as well. There are over like 1,400 sessions. So there's tons of stuff on recommenders. And I think there'll be some stuff on search. So, yep. Any questions, you can find us on LinkedIn and hopefully uh, you've enjoyed at least the 50,000 foot view. Thank you very much, Mark. That was awesome. I really enjoyed uh, listening to that talk, learned a lot. Um, if anybody has questions, we do have a few minutes for questions now. Um, so feel free to uh, either unmute or ask your question or post something in the chat and I can read it off and then Mark uh, can answer. I, I do have a couple actually questions to mm -hmm. kick things off. Um, you, you were talking about like, I, I thought it was really interesting what you said about like the vendor data, like the third party vendor data and mm -hmm. like perhaps it not being as clean or people like maybe trying to push their results to the top. Have you seen, or are there like techniques for actually trying to like pull out and handle any of those like bad actors or people like trying to game the system? And like, I, the thing that I could think of is like maybe Amazon merchants trying to put in specific keywords into their things that maybe aren't related, but that are boosting the signal of their products, you know? Yep. And, you know, everyone's trying to, especially in e-commerce, right? Everyone's trying to game, game those algorithms. Uh, that's why I think looking at your signal data is, is extremely important. So for instance, if I took all my signal data, I looked at these products that were purchased. I looked at all the queries that led to it. 
and looks, let's say we focus on the specification problem, right? These vendors were specifying their data in a certain way. And now I see the users are specifying it in a, in a different way. Um, you know, making those types of associations, I think you can begin to normalize data in terms of, hey, if 85% of people dis describe things in centimeters, I'll put a greater weight on centimeters or something like that, right? That's sort of a contrived example. But the point being, um, when you see situations like that occurring, go check your signal data to see, because what's most important is that people find things, right? Vendors can fight against each other, but the main thing is that people find things that they want. So I would, I would more focus on that um, sort of approach there. And yeah, I haven't, I haven't dug too much into like normalization algorithms where you'd automatically be predicting, all right, I put in this query and then I give you this normalized version. That's kind of like a sequence to sequence type thing where I'm generating a new sequence, uh, matching some of your dimensions, but um, that's, that's a little trickier problem on the deep learning side. Sure. Makes sense. Thank you. Uh, so we've had a question about from Philip uh, about the video and deck being shared. So yeah, we're, we'll share that. Um, the video should be posted probably tomorrow on the PyData YouTube channel. And I'll make sure to put a comment on the meetup page. That way everybody has access to the, the recording and the slides. Um, Philip also had another question actually. He asked, uh, could you expand a bit on knowledge graph building? Perhaps there are any resources or frameworks to look into. Yeah, um, so this is a, I need to tread tread carefully, right? So the first thing I would ask is, you know, at what scale are you talking, right? Are you talking Airbnb scale, Walmart scale? Then you start getting into, um, I have so much traffic coming in that I need to respond very quickly. Uh, so you need bigger hardware. So you need more performant, I would say, graph traversal algorithms. Um, knowledge graph, when I sort of speak about it at, at its highest level, is just the, the entities that you've, described or pulled out of your data versus, excuse me, um, how they relate to each other. So a very interesting point is that in e-commerce, you essentially have a knowledge graph already there, but it's just unconnected, meaning, you know, a product exists as itself. This glasses exists on its own as a product. This phone exists on its own versus um, let's say you're in finance and you have finance documents there may be so many entities inside of a single document, like names, locations, persons, companies. So understanding what domain you're in and in terms of frameworks, um, any of the standard like Neo4j guys, uh, I think there's like a tiger graph, um, but then you start getting into RDF graphs versus property graphs. And, and that takes you down a rabbit hole that to me, it's a little more, uh, that's an easier problem to solve when you have the relations already encoded. So I would almost just put this thing in a flat file where, you know, this company is related to this person, that company is related to that person. And then you might include that in your index to query or include it as a synonym. Um, but I would say a Neo4j to answer for, from a resources perspective. And some of those links that I had there, go check out those articles and they'll go into why they focused on um, knowledge graphs. Um, we've got a couple more minutes and if anybody has questions, feel free to unmute now or uh, post it in the chat. Um, actually, uh, Mark, uh, uh, I know that you sent me a link to the slides on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. Is that still the best link? Can I actually just drop that to everybody now? Yeah, you could drop it now. And what I'll do is um, I'm going to re-upload this version. I, I put some extra slides on there and things, but most of the links in there are quite the same. So feel free to share that version. Absolutely. Okay, great. So I'm going to post that in the chat now, just so everybody knows that an updated one will be coming shortly. And somebody's asking for the PyData YouTube. If you just search PyData on YouTube, you know that that channel will come up, and all of the different meetup chapters and conferences from PyData post there. So uh, there's definitely a lot of good content on it. Um, and like I said, I'll post it in the meetup uh, page once once ours is posted. Any I can offer a question. Yeah. Uh, Mark, thank you for the very good presentation. My question has to do with uh, visualization tools for common signal collections. Mm. Uh, so you've got all of these signals that have come in over JavaScript, how you've scrolled, how long you looked at an image, what mm -hmm. your mouse movements were, whether you zoomed in or not, things that are you know, less tangible than did you click and did you buy. Yes. Is, is there a visualization tool, something like Google Analytics for the clicks 
uh, but instead for the, the signals that you could use to visualize the data and develop some kind of idea what you have and what direction you want to try to take it with. I think the first, my, my short answer is, is no, like I hadn't seen any visualization stuff and that's some of the stuff before I left Lucid Works, that was one of the ideas is, hey, how do I look at these associations at a sort of macro level, right? Um, the first thing I would say is to make sure that you tie your signals together, meaning in time, right? So I have this query, someone clicks on something, or even if they didn't click on it, I think it's even more valuable to know the dual times and things like you're expressing, right? And then I would almost do a simple filtering. So for instance, if you put everything um, in pandas, like, you know, this person won, I, I look at all a user's data. So it's almost looking at different views of the data, right? And I would actually just use pandas to sort of do some data frame visualization, keep it in Python for now, especially if it's not big scale. Uh, so I would look at a, a user view. So for this user, what are all the things that they did? So um, you could do some bokeh plots. B-O-K-E-H is a good thing to use, like bokeh. And you could probably build like a streamlit app on top of it. So you can give it to like a business owner where they can, you know, toggle different buttons to see different views of that data, right? So rounding out that point, if you had a user view, so this user did all of these different actions, and you can just count the amount of actions that different users use. That's one form of segmentation. So show me all users that had four actions or who spent more than 10 seconds on a particular item or type of item. You see what I'm saying? Yes. Sounds like there's an opportunity for a business there. Absolutely. Uh, everyone's collecting the same signals. In fact, when I'm on Facebook, I feel like I'm being psychologically profiled uh, more than I'm getting out of it. Uh, mm -hmm. They're getting out all, all very uh, minute details about my impulses. Yeah. And when you spend a lot of time in search and you see a bunch of different search data from different customers, what you realize is people fix your search, right? If people want something from your site and your search sucks, they're going to get it. They're going to put in this query. They're going to scroll to the 10th page and find it. So if you're not using that, you're not leveraging the work that folks are doing to, to make your search better. That's why Google just has one bar. Tell me what you want. And they're going to have all those associations behind the hood. They have you on the Chrome browser so they can track everything in there as well. So all the things that you're talking about, they are leveraging under the hood to, you know, I don't want to say profile you, but pretty much get a very good picture of what, what and who you are. Thank you. Absolutely. Cool. I, I do have one more, and I think that might be the last sure. question. Okay. Get, get, getting a lot for you. Um, I, you were talking about using like different models and like obviously like trying to combine. It's kind of might be more difficult to combine the predictions from multiple different types of models that might be in your search or, you know, coming mm -hmm. from different places. For like somebody kind of going after this and like building out, you know, some, some search models, would you think about like, trying to perfect one model that you have with one data source, let's just say like, like text-based um, or like lexical, right? Mm -hmm. Or should you kind of try to maybe like diversify like where your data is coming from? I know it might depend, you know, you know what I mean? Like tweaking, squeezing out performance from one model or like, you know, stacking different ones. Yeah. Um, the first thing I'd say to that is let's look at the hardware that you're running on, right? First of all, for bigger language models, you need bigger hardware to do inference, right? So the first thing is, what's my response time? Let's, if we're really focused on search, what's the response time I have to, to go after? That'll filter a bunch of different algorithms that you can use on, let's say if you had a certain amount of hardware dedicated to it. And then if you know what your service level agreement is for your response time, the hardware that you have, look at the pool of algorithms that you have there. And I would say focus on one first, right? And see how good that you can get and be like, all right, well, I actually need to maybe try a, a dual approach, right? To see if you, you're ensembling two different methods. Um, so I, I would do one at a time for sure. Not all through three, four or five. That'll, that'll especially if it's just yourself, like, no. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Makes sense. That makes sense. Perfect. Great. Okay. Well, um, looks like the whole crowd stuck around for the, for the whole talk. So that's awesome. Um, thank you again so much, Mark.
Absolutely. And it's a pleasure uh, speaking with all of y'all and hope you have a great day. Awesome. Well, thanks again, everybody. Stay tuned for our next meetup. We're going to post a video, like I said, probably tomorrow. So thanks all for coming. See everyone. Bye.